Let us again call to mind whither modern initiation leads after the first steps toward imaginative cognition have been taken with successful results. The student finds that his previous transitory, abstract, and purely ideal world of thought is now permeated with inner life. He is no longer faced with lifeless thoughts acquired by knowledge of a passive nature, but with an inner world of living strength which is to him as the very pulsation of his blood or drawing a fresh breath. The ideal element in thought becomes a reality which is experienced inwardly. This is the point. The pictures of which our thoughts formerly consisted are no longer abstract and shadowy, no longer mere projections of the outer world, but are inwardly filled with living being. They are true imaginations, which, as I pointed out yesterday, are experienced in two dimensions, but not as one sees painted pictures in the physical world, for, seen thus, they would be mere visions and not imaginations. One really seems to be moving about in one's own person within the picture, from which the third dimension has disappeared. What we experience is not seen as we see things in the physical world. Anything seen in that way can be nothing but a vision. Real higher cognition only begins when the imagination is such that colors, for instance, are no longer seen as in the physical world, but are experienced. When we perceive them in the physical world, we have distinctly different experiences with each different color. We perceive red as an aggressive color. It seems to spring out at one. The bull defends itself against this aggressive color, which it feels much more strongly than does the human being, in whom every feeling has now grown less intense. When we experience green, we feel something like a sense of balance, no pain, but on the other hand, no particular feeling of joy. When we experience blue, we have a feeling of devotion and humility. Now it is possible so to permeate ourselves with the different experiences aroused in us in the physical world, that when we encounter in the spiritual world something which approaches us in the aggressive attacking manner of the color red, we connect it with that color. When we meet with something that arouses in us a feeling of humility, it is the same experience as that produced in us in the physical world by a blue or bluish mauve color. And we may say, roughly speaking, that we have experienced red and blue in the spiritual world. But if we wish to be quite accurate, we ought always to say that we have had a similar experience to that felt when we have seen red or blue in the physical world. To avoid such a long-winded sentence, we abbreviate it and speak of having an auric perception or view which differs in respect to green or red or blue and so on. In this connection, however, it must be noted that this passing over into the supersensible this stripping away of everything, of every physical and yet concrete experience is always there. Yet, in this same concrete experience, we feel, as I described yesterday, something like the transmutation of our thinking into an instrument of touch which fills the whole human organism. So that spiritually, we feel as though we were in touch, in contact with a newly arisen world. Not yet the true spiritual world, but one which I would call the world of formative forces, or etheric world. If we wish to gain knowledge of the ether, it must be gained in this way. No speculation or reflection can lead to a true knowledge of it. In the transmuted thought we ourselves live in our body of formative forces, or etheric body, but our life is different from the one we lived in the physical world. And I will describe this kind of life by means of an example. Your fingers are a living part of your organism, but if you cut one off it is no longer what it was before. It dies. It is no longer alive. 
If that finger possessed consciousness, it would say, I am only part of an organism. I have no independent existence. We too have to admit this the moment we live in the world in our imaginative cognition. We no longer feel ourselves to be separate, individualized beings, but a part of the whole etheric world, of the whole etheric cosmos. And later we know that we gained both individuality and personality through having put on a physical body. The physical body gives individuality. It is the physical body that makes us separate thing, separate beings. If by, mean, if by the means described we ascend into the spiritual world, we shall presently see that we can also become individualized in the spiritual world, and that will be explained later. If we rise by these methods into that world, we cannot help feeling ourselves part of the etheric cosmos. If we were ever, as regards our etheric body, to be cut off from the cosmic ether, we should expire etherically. It is very important to grasp this, that we may properly understand what is to be said later concerning man's passage through the gate of death. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, the picture experiencing which forms the tableau of our life on earth from our birth to the present time is accompanied in the etheric world by an extremely strong feeling of happiness. The first and very pleasant higher experience a man has is this running through his whole picture world, and this is accompanied by an inwardly felt feeling of happiness. But now, as I indicated yesterday, the inspiration acquired in this way from the life tableau must be eradicated from our consciousness by an act of will. Our consciousness must be rendered void of content. Only when it is made empty can we understand the actual position of things in the spiritual world. Only when we have reached the stage of the cessation of consciousness does the spiritual world pour into us through the thinking which has become an instrument of touch, just as the physical world reaches us through our senses. Then only do we begin to have true experience, real knowledge of the spiritual world, of the outer world of the spirit. In our life tableau, we had only our inner world. Imaginative cognition presents only the inner world which comes before our higher cognition as a picture world. It gives us only pictures of the cosmos. But the cosmos itself, as also our own true being, is shown in inspiration, as it was before birth, before earthly existence. These only appear in inspiration, when the spiritual world streams into us from without. When we have succeeded in rendering our consciousness void of content, our soul is at first filled with mere wakefulness, and in this state of wakefulness we must be able to attain a certain inner stillness, a state of quietude, which can only be described in the following way. Let us imagine ourselves in a very noisy city. All around us there is the noise of the city. It seems dreadful that on every side there is nothing but noise of all sorts. We must think of a great modern city, such, for instance, as London. The further we go out of London, with every step we take, the noise grows less. Let us picture ourselves amid this gradual lessening of sound. All grows more and more still. At last, perhaps, we may reach a wood in which there is no sound at all, when we hear nothing and when all is silent within us. We have then, in a sense, reached the vanishing point of the audible. This can, however, be carried further. And to make this clear, I must use a trivial example. Suppose one has money in one's purse, and day by day one takes a little out. The money grows less, as does the volume of sound. At last the day comes when, having received no more money, there is none at all left in a, one's purse. We may compare that emptiness with the stillness. 
What must one do now to get something to eat? One must run into debt, and I do not precisely advise this. I am only using the example. How much remains in the purse? Less than nothing, and in proportion as the debts increase, increasingly less than nothing. Now imagine the same position as regards the stillness. Suppose there was not only absolute stillness, absolute quiet, the cessation of all sound, but that matters went further, that the negation of hearing were there, stiller than stillness, that something profounder than silence was there. This would actually come about if, by the methods described yesterday, we were able, by means of our quickened forces, to establish this inner stillness of silence. When we attain this inner negative audibility, when we reach this stillness which is more intense than absolute stillness, we find ourselves not only seeing in the spiritual world, but hearing its sounds. What we have seen is now enhanced by what we hear and becomes a more living world. We are then in the true spiritual world. For the short time we are there, we do in a sense reach the far shore. Beyond that, the ordinary world of sense vanishes, and we find ourselves in the spiritual world. It is, however, necessary, as I shall explain later, that we come, that we should be properly prepared, so as to be able to come back at any moment. Something more is yet to follow, an experience which no one of us can have had before. What I have described as the feeling of intense cosmic happiness experienced inwardly is transmuted as soon as the emptied consciousness is filled with stillness into just as strong a feeling of psychic pain, just as intense a feeling of psychic sorrow. We now experience that the world is built on the foundation of cosmic suffering, or rather of a cosmic element which can only be felt by man as pain. We are filled with the knowledge of that truth which is so often disregarded by the humanity which only seeks external pleasure. We learn the truth that all existence must in the last resort come to birth through suffering. When we have thus penetrated so far into initiation knowledge as to have reached the experience of cosmic pain, we can say from true inner knowledge, when we consider our eyes, these eyes which reveal to us the beauty of the physical world, these eyes which represent nine-tenths of our life content between birth and death as regards our physical existence, we know that these eyes are embedded, that they are indentations in our head, and that in reality they originally represented a bodily injury. That which could only come into existence if the body were injured by being hollowed out, itself produced the hollow cavities. The external history of evolution represents this in far too neutral, too indifferent a way. The physical account of the evolution of the eyeball proves that the sockets of the eyes were produced by pressure from without, at a time when man was still an unconscious being. This event, were it to be recalled to our consciousness, would represent a painful wounding of our organism. In like manner, the whole of man's organism was brought forth from an element which, if experienced with our existing consciousness, would be seen to have been an experience of pain. At this stage of cognition, we feel deeply that all the happiness, all the joy and all the bliss in the world has come forth from a foundation of pain, just as the plants come forth from the earth's surface, and this process also really signifies pain. If we human beings could be changed for a moment into the substance of the earth's surface while retaining our consciousness, we should experience an immense increase of suffering. A superficial person hearing these facts, which I pass on to you from the spiritual world, may make the following objection. Quote, I have thought of God as being very different. I thought he was so powerful that he caused everything to come forth in happiness as we should wish it to be. Close quote. Such persons are like that king of Spain who was given a model of the universe and of the movement of the heavenly bodies 
and who had to make a very great effort to understand how these movements came about, and still in the end could not grasp it, and who said, quote, If God had left the creation to me, I should not have made it so complicated. Close quote. This attitude is fundamentally characteristic of the religion and knowledge of many people. If God had left the creation of the world to them, they would have made it simpler. These persons do not know how foolishly they talk. A true science of initiation cannot simply lead to what makes people happy. Rather should it lead them to understand their own being and their evolution in the world in the past, present and future. Spiritual facts are required instead of a mere content that pleases people at once. Through the living experience of these facts, however, as will be shown in these lectures, or even by an understanding knowledge of them, a fair measure of inner satisfaction can be obtained even in earth life. Indeed, a man can thus acquire what he needs for his life on earth as much as he needs his different limbs to be a complete man. The world that can be entered in this way, when having transcended imagination, we pass into the stillness of that existence in which colors glow and sounds are heard telling of the spiritual worlds, differ, spiritual world, differs essentially from the world perceived by means of the senses. When we share in the life of the spiritual world, and we must take part in it if we are to be aware of its existence, we observe that all physical things and events have in reality come forth from it, so that man, as earth-man, really sees but one half of the world. The other half is hidden from him. It remains occult. This latter, notwithstanding all the divisions and occurrences of the physical sense world, reveals itself as spiritual, first in the pictures of imagination and then in what it creatively yields in inspiration. In this world of inspiration we can learn to feel at home, and we then find in it the origins of all earth things, all earth creations. We find within it, as I have already indicated, our own pre-earthly existence. This will be described more closely in the subsequent lectures. As a terminology is necessary, though names are of no importance, I shall use the expression of olden times, and call this world, which lies beyond the imaginative, the astral world, and what we ourselves possess which belongs to that world, and which we brought with us into physical and etheric body, we may in like manner call the astral body of man. Within this the actual organism for the ego is to some extent enclosed. <clears throat> Thus to higher cognition it becomes evident that man is a four-membered being consisting of physical body, etheric body, or body of formative forces, astral body, and the organism for the ego. To the latter we can only rise, however, through a further step forward in supersensible cognition, which I have described in my books and particularly entitled How to Attain Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, close quote, or sorry, end of title. This step is therein called intuition. This expression can be very easily misunderstood, because a person who has imagination and poetic fancy may call his impressions intuition, though they are really connected with feeling. Such intuition is dim and simply the result of feeling, though it is related to what I here call intuition. For though man, being an inhabitant of earth, is in complete possession of his sense perceptions here, Yet through his earthly feelings and his earthly will, he may obtain a reflection of intuition knowledge of the highest kind. Were it not so, he could never be a moral being. Thus that which is felt dimly in his conscience, and as though by premonition is a reflection, a shadow picture, as it were, of the highest, which is only revealed in true intuition, and is the highest cognition possible to man on earth. As earthman he really possesses something of the lowest as well as a shadow picture of the highest, attainable only through intuition. It is precisely the realm between imagination and inspiration which is lacking in man and which he must acquire. 
He must also acquire intuition in its pure and light-filled inwardness, though he already possesses an earthly impression of this in his moral feelings and in the contents of his ethical conscience. Thus we may say that when a man rises to a true intuitive knowledge of the world, when he is initiated into that, the world which he otherwise only knows through the laws of nature becomes just as inward, just as inwardly connected with him as the world of morality is related to him as earth man. The significant feature of human beings on earth is that with a dim and inwardly excuse me, an inward longing, they depend on the highest, though this in its true form is only accessible to the knowledge they acquire through development. The third stage of higher knowledge necessary for the attainment of the region of intuition can only be reached by the highest development of an inner capacity, which in our materialistic age is not reckoned as forming part of the powers of knowledge. Only through the highest development and spiritualization of the love capacity can man acquire what is revealed in intuition. It must become possible for man to transform his love capacity into a force for knowledge. We are making good preparation for this spiritualized love capacity when we tear ourselves away to some extent from our dependence on external things, as for instance when we reg regularly practice picturing the things we have experienced, not in their proper order, but going through them retrospectively, running through them backward. As regards our passive thinking, we are, I might say, like human slaves, devoted to the events of the world. I said in yesterday's lecture that in our thought pictures we think first of what happened earlier and afterward of what happened later. When we go to see a play we see the first act first and then the second, third, fourth and fifth. If, however, we could rise to being able to begin at the very end of the last act, go back through that and then begin the end of the fourth and back through that to the third and the second and end with the beginning of the first act, we should then be tearing ourselves free from the course which the world runs externally. Our ideas would travel backward, which is not the way of the world's course. To do this, to be able to reverse the usual course of our ideas, a strong and significant personal effort is required, for which the necessary force must be drawn wholly from within. By so doing we set the inner activity of our souls free from the leading strings by which we are continually being guided, and we thus gradually carry our spiritual psychic experience to the point where the spirit and soul nature really frees itself from the physical and etheric principles. A man can very well prepare himself for this if every evening he makes a mental retrospect of the day's experiences, beginning with those which occurred last, then traveling back, and whenever possible picturing even the details in this backward sequence, so that if his last act was walking upstairs, he must first picture himself on the highest step, and then on the last but one, and so on picturing the whole process of going upstairs in the reverse sequence. It may be said that we have so many experiences in the course of the day that this would take too long. Well, to begin with, it may be practiced in episodes, going back over the ascent of the stairs. The descent and the ascent might at first be practiced singly, till at last we acquire such inner mobility that the whole day can really be run through backwards in the course of three or four minutes. This, however, is only half, and the negative half, of what is necessary to acquire before we are able to rise to a spiritual development of the love capacity. For this must be carried so far that we lovingly participate in the growth of the plant. In ordinary life we only watch the growth of plants and space. We do not share in it. We must share in every detail of what can be seen of its growth. We must sink into and become one with it in soul. We must feel ourselves growing and blossoming and bearing fruit. 
The plant must be just as precious to us as we are to ourselves. We must rise to having a like feeling about the animal and also the mineral. We must feel how the mineral forms itself into the crystal. And we must be able to develop a sort of feeling of inner satisfaction in the formation of smooth surfaces, edges and angles, and in realizing the forms themselves. And to feel a sort of pain shoot through our own being with the splitting and breaking up of the mineral. We must in this way participate in the feeling and also in the willing of all the occurrences of nature. This must be preceded by a true capacity for love, extending to all humanity. We shall not be able to love nature aright in the above described way if we have not first developed love for all men. When we have thus developed an understanding capacity of love for humanity and for the whole of nature, then only does that become perceptible, at first in the auric colors and sounds of the spheres, which finally take the contours of true spiritual beings. To experience these spiritual beings, however, is different from experiencing physical things. When I see a physical object before me, the clock on the wall, for instance, I stand here and the clock is over there. I can only experience it by seeing it. It is at a distance from me. There is a definite space between us. We can never have that experience with a spiritual being, but must completely sink down into it, at the same time bringing into play the love capacity which we must first have developed with regard to nature. Spiritual intuition can only come when we can bring into the stillness, into that which is void of content for the consciousness, the love capacity developed for nature. Suppose you have developed a capacity for love of minerals, plants, animals and man, and find yourself in the emptiness of your consciousness. Around you, in the negative quietude below the vanishing point, you feel the suffering lying at the base of all cosmic existence. It is both suffering and solitude. As yet there is nothing there. Then you feel the love capacity welling up in your inner being, a love differentiated in the most multitudinous way. And that will lead you to what now appears in inspiration to the perceptible, to the audible. And this will enable you really to penetrate these with your own being. By means of this love, you sink into one being after another. At this stage, one experiences the beings described in my book, An Outline of Esoteric Science, as the beings of the higher hierarchies. They become real, living beings of cosmic existence, we thus experience a concrete spiritual world, just as we experience a concrete physical world through our eyes, ears, and sense of touch. This stage must be attained if we wish to reach a knowledge which is very essential to man. I have described how through inspiration the pre-earthly, purely spiritual existence pours into our soul and how only through this inspiration we can learn what we were before we descended into an earthly body through conception. When we become clear-sighted in the manner just described and can penetrate within the spiritual beings, there is then revealed to us what first makes the human being complete in his inner experience and which lies in the spiritual world. We are then what we were before we ascended into the last spiritual life between death and rebirth. Our previous earth life is revealed to us and also gradually the lives before that. For the true ego which lives through repeated earth lives can only reveal itself when we have so enhanced our love capacity that another being, whether outside in nature or in the spiritual world, is just as dear to us as we are to ourselves, that we love it as dearly as we do our own selves. The true ego that passes through repeated earth lives can never be accessible to self-love. These former lives only reveal themselves to a man 
when he no longer lives in self-love for the experience of the moment, but in that love which is able wholly to forget self and to live in another being, just as one usually lives in physical existence, loving oneself and filled with self-love. This ego of preceding earth lives has become just as objective to this earth life as an external stone or plant is to us when we stand outside it in space. We must have learned to grasp in objective love that which to the present subjective personality has become quite foreign. We must have conquered ourselves in the present earth life before we can obtain even a glimpse of a former one. When, however, we develop this cognition, the complete life of man discloses itself as passing in rhythmic waves through stages of earthly existence from birth or conception to death, and again through purely spiritual stages of existence from death to a new birth, to return once more to earth, and so on, and so on. The complete earth life reveals itself as a repeated passing through birth and death, with intermediate stages of life in pure spiritual worlds. This knowledge can only be acquired through intuition, as real cognition gained by experience. I had to give a description, though but a sketchy one, of the path to intuition knowledge, which must be followed in our age, at the present point in the development of humanity, for the attainment of really spiritual knowledge of the nature of the world and of man. There has, however, ever since humanity existed, always been initiation knowledge, and this had to take different forms at different periods in the development of mankind. Now, as man is a being who, in each one of his earth lives, has to go through different experiences in his soul, it naturally follows that what appears in the different epochs of the world's evolution must differ considerably. We shall hear of these differences in the course of the next few days. Today I shall only mention that what had to be given as initiation knowledge in the olden times of man's evolution was completely different from that of today. If we go back some thousands of years before the mystery of Golgotha, this will be entered into more minutely later on, we find man occupying a very different relation to the world of nature and the spiritual world than is right for the present time. And the initiation knowledge was correspondingly different too. At the present day we possess a very highly evolved natural science. I do not now refer to the more advanced branches, only to what is taught to children of six or seven years of age as general knowledge. At a comparatively tender age a child learns the laws of the Copernican cosmic system, and based on these he learns how the universe probably came into being. In this connection he is told of the Kant Laplace hypothesis and how that has now been superseded, although in reality we have it still. We are told of a primeval mist which can be imitated today by experiments in physics, showing the first phases of the coming into being of the world. We contemplate a primeval mist, out of which the planets came into existence through the forces of rotation while the sun remained behind. We have then to think of the earth as having been compressed out of this curious circle, as having split off from the primeval mist. And the later beings, minerals, plants, animals, and lastly man, are supposed to have come about through differentiation. All this is described in a purely scientific way. The process is made quite clear to the children by a sort of demonstration. A drop of oil, a fluid floating on water, is put in the vicinity of the equator on a piece of cardboard into which a pin is, stru is stuck and caused to revolve. It is then demonstrated how first a drop separates from the outer edge and rotates, then a second drop splits away and so on until there is a complete miniature planetary system of oil with the sun in the center. How should a child seeing that not think it a very plausible explanation of the origin of our planetary system 
from a primeval mist. He sees the whole process with his own eyes. Now, in life it is a very good thing, in a moral sense, to forget oneself. But in conducting a demonstration of natural phenomena, one ought not to leave oneself out of account. The story of the drop of oil could not have developed if the demonstrator had not been there to turn the pin. That fact should be taken into account. If this example is to hold good as an hypothesis, we must conceive a gigantic schoolmaster outside in the universe who first set the primeval mist in motion, and must indeed still continue to do so, otherwise the thought is not carried to its logical conclusion. It is just the peculiarity of this materialistic age that only a quarter or an eighth or even a lesser fraction of the truth is imagined. But this fraction works with immense success on the souls of men and lives on within them. That is why we today are living in a one-sided conception of nature and its laws. I could bring forward many a proof to show how in various spheres man turns to nature, but as our present civilization teaches in the above-mentioned fashion, he only views it in the light of what I might call the laws of causality. The spiritual world we can at most only retain through the traditions of religion. If, however, we really aspire to rising to the true spiritual world, we must go through an inner development through imagination, inspiration, and intuition in the manner described. We must be led through initiation knowledge away from the methods of investigation based on law, or rather from the belief in such methods of investigating the life of nature and turn to a realization of the spiritual. All initiation wisdom must, at the present time, tend to lead man away from the obvious and natural concept of the cosmos to a spiritual understanding of it. The exact opposite was the rule in the old initiation wisdom thousands of years ago. The wise men, the heads of the schools of initiation, which at that time were also churches, were then surrounded by a humanity knowing nothing at all of nature in the sense in which man has learned of it since the Copernican conception of the universe. Those teachers were surrounded by a humanity having an instinctive, inner spiritual knowledge, men to whom all that pertained to the soul was a cosmic experience. And they recorded their spiritual, psychic, cosmic knowledge in legends and myths, which are no longer understood by our present civilization. I shall also speak of these more fully later on. Their experience was instinctive and spiritual, and this filled them during their waking hours with dreamlike pictures and imaginations which came forth from the inner being of primeval man in the form of legends and myths and dreamy imaginations, and which became the sagas of the gods. In these he lived. He looked out into the cosmos and experienced his dreamlike imaginations. When he was not living in these, he lived in the life of nature. He saw the rainbow, the clouds, the stars, the sun traveling across the sky. He saw the rivers, the mountains and their growth and being. He saw the minerals, plants and animals. All that he perceived with his senses was a great enigma to primeval man. For at the time of which I am speaking, there were other still more primeval periods, as well as later ones in which the civilization was again different, but at the time to which I am now referring, some thousands of years before the mystery of Golgotha, the humanity then existent felt inwardly blessed when it had the dreamy imaginations. The external world, however, in which those men only saw as much of the rainbow, the clouds, the moving sun of the minerals, plants and animals, as could be seen with their eyes, which perceptions were then registered in the Ptolemaic, pre-Copernican cosmic system. That outer world of the senses so appeared to the humanity of that time that it said, I, with my own soul, really live in the divine spiritual world. Outside is a nature void of God. When I look at the wells, I see no spirituality therein, 
The rainbow has none, nor have the minerals, plants or animals or other physical men. Close quote. To them nature appeared as universe, a world that had fallen away from the divine spirit. This was the feeling of humanity at that time. The whole visible cosmos was seen as something that had fallen from the divine spiritual. Men did not need to have abstract knowledge whereby to connect their two experiences, the inner experience of God and the outer experience of a fallen sense world. What humanity then required was a knowledge able to console a man for belonging with his physical and etheric bodies to this fallen world of sense. He wanted something to console him which could prove the relation of this fallen world to that which he experienced in his instinctive imagination through a dim and dreamy yet for the then existing conditions sufficing experience of the spiritual world. Knowledge had to be of a consoling nature. Those who hastened into the mysteries were seeking consolation, whether they sought for that purpose what could be given out externally, or became pupils of those wise men in order to be initiated into the secrets of existence. They all sought consolation for the enigmas with which humanity was faced. Those old wise men of the mysteries, who were at the same time priests and teachers as well as artists, explained to that humanity, through that which dwelt in in their mysteries, of which I shall speak later, how in the rippling spring, in the blossoming tree and flower, in the mineral in course of becoming crystal, in the rainbow, in the moving cloud and moving sun, there lived the same divine spiritual powers experienced by man in his dreamlike imaginations. They showed humanity the reconciliation of the world that has fallen away from God with the divine world of which a man becomes aware in his instinctive imagination. They gave man that consoling knowledge. When a man sought this in the mysteries, the wise ones gave him the knowledge that once more showed nature filled even to human perception with the divine. Hence, we see how in those olden times of mankind's evolution the knowledge which we today teach our youngest children at school and which came from Greece, that the sun is immovable and that the earth revolves around it, that knowledge was preserved, that knowledge was preserved in the mysteries as an occult science. What is now entirely external knowledge with us was then occult science. The, nat- the ex- explanation of nature was an occult science at that time. Everyone who takes part in the process of the evolution of mankind in our present civilization can see for himself, as every thinking and educated man does, that it is nature and her laws in which man is absorbed, but at the cost of the withdrawal of the spiritual world. The old dreamlike imaginations have ceased, Man now feels nature to be something in which he does not find full satisfaction. It presents a neutral aspect. It is no longer a fallen, sinful universe, a cosmos fallen away from God, but one which is compelled by inner necessity to be what it is. He then replenishes his self-consciousness and becomes aware of spirituality at every point. He feels the inner pressure trying to bring his inner being into union with God. All that is now required is that he should be led to the knowledge of nature and thereby into the spiritual through a new initiation science. The old initiation science was able to lead man into nature from the spirit in which he instinctively lived and which he embodied in his myths. The modern science of initiation must be based on what is a man's earliest experience today when he learns of the laws of nature and believes in them. It must start from his knowledge of natural law and then show him the way back to the spiritual world through imagination, inspiration and intuition. Thus, several thousand years before the mystery of Golgotha came the important time 
when men departed from an instinctive experiencing of the spiritual to attain as the most external occult science those concepts and ideas which comprise the laws of nature. We today gain knowledge of these in our childhood. In face of this empty, prosaic view of life, the spiritual world withdrew into the inner being of man. Today the science of initiation must point out the way back from nature to spirituality. To humanity of old, nature was in darkness, the spirit in the light. The task of the old science of initiation was to lead the light of the spiritual brightness into the darkness of nature that it too might be illuminated. The initiation science of today must start from the light externally thrown on nature by Copernicus, Giordano Bruno, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and so forth. This light must be taken from that which is in a state of death to lighten the way back to the spirit which in its own light must take the contrary path to that followed by the old science of initiation.